Welcome to Chat with the Lawyer. I'm your host, Walla Blagay, and today we have a special guest, Miss Attorney Susan Burke, who has represented individuals who have experienced sexual assault in the military, and we're going to talk with her about the response from the military and what happened after. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Walla. I really appreciate it. So tell us um, how you got into this. How did you in, um, interact with, how did they find you? Sure. Well, I actually began doing work uh, representing the Iraqis that were tortured at Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. Wow. And then through that, I ended up, uh, kind of through networking, I ended up also representing the Iraqis that were killed by Blackwater at the Nisor Square massacre. So from that, what happened is a lot of soldiers who were overseas learned of me, and they began to reach out for me for, to, for help of various sorts. And so the, the whole effort around the rape and sexual assault kind of grew out of that, where I just had somewhat of a name in the war space. And there aren't a lot of attorneys that were representing Iraqi victims, so it was a fairly small group. So what happened is a woman who lived down in Kentucky uh, emailed me, and she told me this story of having been raped by a soldier who she knew, a friend of her husband's. Her husband was a soldier, she was not. But they lived on a military base, and so she was raped by this soldier. And when it occurred, she went and reported it to the military police. She didn't realize, as you don't, I grew up a military brat, so I kind of understand this. When you live on a base, the military is everything. You know, it provides everything. So she didn't even consider reporting to civilian authorities, even though she was a civilian. She reported to the military police. They then brought it to the JAG, the Judge Advocate General, so the military lawyers, um, some of whom play the role of prosecutors and some of whom play the role of defense attorneys. So this woman brought the, uh, the information to the, the, the police who got her in touch with the prosecutor and charges were brought against the man that raped her. So about a week before the court martial, she received a telephone call from the prosecutor who apologized to her and said, oh, Christy, I'm so sorry, but the evidence you gave us, your underwear that had the rapist semen on it, we lost it. What? <laughs> exactly. So she went to trial. Uh, you know, they, the trial proceeded and no conviction resulted. Not surprisingly, what would no the... evidence. <laughs> exactly. So... Uh, so we fast forward six months. She's home recovering, trying to get over that injustice, that lack of justice. And she gets a call out of the blue from someone who identifies himself as an army official. And he says to her, oh, you know, Ms. Smith, you need to come pick up your things. And she says, what are you talking about? And he says, oh, well, we have your red underwear. Well, that was my reaction, Walla. So I read this story that this woman had contacted me via email. I read that story and I thought, well, that is outrageous, right? Right. So she had asked, she, in the email, she gave me her phone number and name and she asked that I call. So I called her and I apologized in advance. I said, listen, you know, this is horrible injustice and really, you know, prosecutorial malpractice, essentially. But I cautioned her, I'm not sure you have any sort of legal claim, because as you know, as a lawyer, there are a lot of protections for prosecutors. And I was really more just reaching out to her because I had been, you know, moved by her story and wanted to do what I could to help. So I called her, and that then led me to begin to look into the military judicial system and how it prosecutes rape and sexual assault. And what I found really much to my dismay was that it is a completely dysfunctional system. They were not convicting people. They weren't court-martialing people. And the upshot is that, you know, just a tiny fraction, about a about 100 people from about 12,000 rapists were being prosecuted, and most of those weren't even being convicted. So really just a dysfunctional judicial system. Now, I have a couple questions. First of all, now, how did you get this information? I can imagine, I know many people have tried to go after the military, and they do for your requests, and many of the things, they, they get nothing. So how did you actually get all this information? Well, what I did at the beginning was I began to read. You know, I bought this beautiful book by a woman named Helen Benedict. It's called The Lonely Soldier. 
And she wrote about what it's like to be female in the military. And unfortunately, since about 20% of female, uh, uh, female soldiers are raped, rape is a big part of that book. So I read that book, which kind of alerted me that it was a big problem. And then I began to just research what had Congress done? Had there been any oversight? So, and you're probably too young to remember, but for me, tailhook was something I recalled. In fact, I, the tailhook was back in the 90s. It was a huge scandal, received an incredible amount of media attention because a, uh, a group of naval aviators had essentially created a gauntlet in a hotel, in a hotel uh, floor. So they were all there for a conference. Very, very few female uh, military at that time and even fewer at the conference. And what these naval aviators did is they created like a line and they, they molested this woman, Paula Kaufman, and they passed her down this, this gauntlet after, just because she stepped off the elevator. She was one of their colleagues, one of their peers. So, she, I mean, they used what, force and... Oh, did yes. They, okay. Oh, yes. So it was a terrible, it was a, a terrible assault And the, it was like her. a train of some sort? Yes, exactly. And so this happened back in the early 90s and, and got a lot of attention. She came forward and there was a congressional investigation and a lot of uh, attention around it. And kind of in the back of my head, I thought, okay, that must have prompted the military to focus and fix this issue. Quite the contrary. It was all, even back then, it was all swept under the rug. So there tended to be congressional hearings. There was a pattern that I looked at that was really a three-decade pattern. A congressional hearing would be prompted by a scandal such as tailhook. They would convene, the Armed Services Committee of the House and the Senate would convene. They would bring the military brass in. The military brass would say, this is a terrible situation, but you can trust us to fix it. We have zero tolerance for rape and military assault. Congress would issue some you know, studies, say, okay, we have to study this, and we're going to have the DOD, the Department of Defense handle this. And so they would give them some mandates, give, give information, you know, so forth. And then, of course, nothing happened, nothing changed, no follow-up. But because of this pattern of forays into congressional oversight, the Department of Defense has, for at least a decade, been cranking out reports on sexual assault. I see, and they, these are open to the public. They are public reports, and there is an incredible wealth of data in the reports. So I was studying the military's own data. It wasn't anything that I came up with. I just looked at the numbers that they were putting out. Wow. Now, they were cranking out these reports with no one ever looking at them. But when you dug into the numbers and you looked at the numbers, they were staggering. And frankly, they remain staggering to this day. It has not really been fixed. Now, also, you said that there were maybe about 100 cases or so. I'm not sure if the percentage. Um, now, why did they take those cases and not the rest? Like, what was it? Was there a distinct difference with some of those cases? Well, what you find, and this is really, to my mind, the critical flaw in the judicial system. Um, you know, as a lawyer, obviously, we have multiple judicial systems in this country. We have the, the federal system, each state has its own system, and then the military has its system. Unique to the military is allowing a layperson who knows the accused and the accuser to play a judicial role. So in the military system, the commander has the power. So this, the commander is someone who fights wars. They are not a lawyer. They're not trained in the law. They're not trained in, in probable cause or reasonable doubt and all the legal standards. They are someone who's, whose background and whose skill set is is combat. These commanders actually play the judicial role of deciding whether or not a, a court martial will go forward. So what happens is that they kind of put their thumb on the scale of justice. And the reason that you were finding a few cases moving forward is that that, that role of that biased commander tended to be tipping towards the sexual predators. And most people would find that surprising, like, wait a minute, you know, someone's been accused of rape, that's a serious accusation. The one thing I've learned, Walla, from doing this work, the only difference between sexual predators and regular people are they tend to be, on average, and this is an academic study uh, with this data, they have higher IQs and they tend to be very charismatic. So the, the vast... Asexual. 
the sexual predators. They are actually very intelligent people. And it's a compulsive behavior. So a sexual predator, if they're not, if they're not stopped, they'll have a lot of repeat victims, right? Hundreds, literally hundreds over the course of their lifetime. So what was happening is a commander is confronted with an allegation of rape from soldier A against soldier B. The, the vast majority of the cases, soldier B, the sexual predator, tended to be a high performer, a better soldier. And they, it, sexual predators tend to target people that are vulnerable. It is often people who aren't doing well, they have different problems that's making them perform per poorly at work, and so forth. Those are the kind of people that predators basically target and you know, pull out and rape. So, it, so, the, sec so the, the victims often were not as good as soldiers as the predators. And this is exactly why I think that you've got to get rid of that, that bias, right? The commander is using pre-existing knowledge gained in a workplace setting right. to make these type of legal decisions, legal decisions. Yeah. and and it and it doesn't it doesn't turn out well for the victims as a result interesting so now for those that are in the military isn't there a rule that they're to go to the jag officer if they if it's something occurred so how did you get into that process like what what was there conflict there well, they don't have to. In fact, most uh, in the United States, there is dual jurisdiction. So if you are raped here in the United States, the, the civilian authorities can also prosecute the rape. And there's an interesting story, a very impressive young woman who was uh, quite high up, kind of one of the superstars. She was raped by one of her colleagues she reported it, and at the time she was in General Petraeus's chain of command, it was not pursued, it was not prosecuted. The investigator, the criminal investigator within the military was so appalled that it had not been prosecuted, he slipped the file to a friend of his in the civilian authorities. They were able to get the guy to plead guilty and serve five years. So there is dual jurisdiction, and as I became more knowledgeable and began to speak to a lot of groups and victims, I encourage anyone who is raped to report it to the civilian authority. Okay, all right. Well, we're gonna take a short sure. break. This is such good information, as you can see, and we're gonna come right back, so please stay with us. You're going to need me. You're going to need us, all of us. You're going to need our help with your water, your air, your food. You're going to need our determination, our compassion, you're going to need the next generation of leaders to face the challenges the future will bring. And we promise we'll be there when you need us. Welcome back to Chat with the Lawyer and we're here back with attorney Susan Burke who was talking about the very interesting case that she had for individuals with sexual assault in the military. So let's get right back into it. So they came to you, you started doing your investigation, and then what's next? Well, then I ended up filing uh, lawsuits in federal court. And one of the things that people don't realize in our country is that our court system is closed to service members. And that, to me, that is just a travesty. You know, there's all this energy around supporting veterans and, and honoring the people that defend us, but the sad reality is that there is a judicial doctrine, not statute, but a judicial doctrine that says if you are on active duty and you're harmed, you cannot sue the government. And as you know from uh, being a lawyer, the Federal Tort Claims Act has waived sovereign immunity. So if, if I go to a you know, government building and I'm hurt by slipping on water, I can sue. Yet soldiers and sailors and airmen cannot. So, so they can go after the individual. They, the, um, the individuals could be sued, but as a practical matter, you know, you're not talking about people that would have money to pay judgments, right? And it's about the system, right? It's about the system. And it's not, if it were, if it were one person or two people, maybe you'd go after the individual. But what we were, what I was really looking at with the folks that, that began to be interested in, a law, in it is how do we change the system that's broken? So we brought an impact litigation in federal court 
challenging the system itself and saying that it was so poorly done, that that judicial system was so broken that it was depriving these men and women of their constitutional rights. Wow. And what was the response? I mean, what was the, what was the response? Well, what we found, and we brought several suits, and what we found in each instance was the district court judge, which is the lowest level in the federal courts, the district court judges uniformly talked about how terrible the facts were and how something needed to be done, but that their hands were tied. We can't do nothing. But we can't do anything. <laughs> and while you'll find this interesting, the reasoning they gave was this judicial doctrine. And what they concluded was that rape and sexual assault was an occupational hazard. It was incident to, to service. To military. Yes. The phrase is incident to service. So that's the phrase that's used. If, if something's part of being in the military, you can't sue about it. It's incident to your service. And so they To be sexually... Yes. That's ridiculous. That's what I think. So we're still fighting those battles in court. Wow. So now there was um, some sort... Did you go to... Where did the attention come from from the media? Because at one point, this was all over the media. Well, what occurred, really due to the bravery of the people that stepped forward for that first lawsuit, because a strategic decision we made was that it was important for those people who were strong enough and willing, it was important that they use their names and step forward and say, this happened to me, I was raped, and this is what the military did. And that takes a lot of courage, right, to put your name on a lawsuit and then they, they were willing to do that, and this is both men and women. And so because of their bravery, uh, some documentary filmmakers who were also, who interestingly enough had read that same book I had, The Lonely Soldier, and you know that journalist, Helen Benedict, in large part really sparked th this because she motivated me and she motivated the, the movie makers, uh, Kirby Dick and Amy Ziering. So they came to me and asked if I would be willing to help them. And I said, yes. And so what I, I recommended to the people that I represented, I recommended that if they were comfortable doing so, that they cooperate with the movie makers. So Kirby and Amy made a very compelling documentary of the, of the firsthand accounts right from the victim's mouths. You know, these people, the survivors, would tell their own stories. And that movie, um, it won an audience award at Sundance, and then a year later, it was nominated for an Academy Award. And the nomination for an Academy Award is really what propelled the issue into the forefront. the forefront. And, you know, Capitol Hill, the people on Capitol Hill then began to pay more attention. So it really, I really credit the movie makers with the, the the publicity that has been brought to bear. And what's the name of the documentary? The documentary is called The Invisible War. Interesting. So now you, it's in the forefront. What, how does the military respond? Are they upset with, are they, do they retaliate against these individuals? Retaliation is rampant. And you know, that is in large part, while you think about it, obviously there's a lot of crime everywhere. And it's, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a terrible tragedy when someone is a victim of a crime. But the reason that this issue so grabbed me and really touched me and made me want to do something is that the, the women and the men that were raped, they had a, a Hobson's choice, a, ter a choice of two terrible alternatives. If they spoke up, they became troublemakers and they would be retaliated against. And their, you know, their teammates, their battalions, their, they, 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 re they suffered. They suffered that career retaliation and essentially most of them would leave the service. Or the other group is then keeping quiet about a crime and not reporting a crime. And so it is that retaliation that is so, it's so troubling in a military context, you can't exercise self-help. I had one young woman at West Point, she was raped by the fellow across the hall. She not only had to continue to see him every day, part of her duties as a, as a first year at West Point, she had to take out his trash. What, wait, if she, if they are, um, if they work together, their colleagues, why is she taking out? It was, he was an upperclassman. I see. And it was part, you know, it was part of the, one of the, the duties. 
And so these, so what you're having is you're having violence in these work settings. And because it's the military, people can't quit their job. They can't just say, wait a minute, I don't want to work next to the rapist. I'm going to quit. Or I don't want to go to the same school as the rapist. I'm going to transfer to a different school. You can't, it would, it, if you just leave, it's AWOL. So everything is so controlled. And that's why in some ways I think these, these survivors are so traumatized because not only are they raped, but then they're powerless to protect themselves from being into forced proximity with the predator, with the rapist. And, and let me ask you now, did any of them, even though they didn't want to go AWOL, did they try to sort of use an honor, get an honorable discharge of some sort? Yes. I mean, many, um, it, it took time, but a lot of them left the service, right? And that again, to me, is a national disgrace because Wait, we have people leaving who sh who want to volunteer to serve serve the nation, and yet they're they're leaving because of the way in which it was handled. So many have in fact left. Some have stayed, but you know over time they can get themselves out. But because of that that inability to do it immediately, when they're at their most vulnerable and most traumatized right after the rape, that's when they have the least power and they are in the forced proximity. And what about the military culture is allowing people who know each other to rape each other? Because well, you know, I think that that is, you know, sadly, there's a misconception that, that stranger rape is prevalent. Really, acquaintance rape is the far prevalent form of rape in our society, in all societies. And I think it has to do with the, you know, over if you look over time, there has been women have been kept in lower places. There's been an acceptance of rape, whether it's rape within the marriage or rape among strangers. So, I mean, rape among acquaintances, date rape, it used to be called back when I was younger. So, I mean, I think the reality is that rape by acquaintances is the, the norm everywhere, not just in the military, but everywhere. Interesting. So um, what, was, what was the response after the Oscar I mean, after you all were nominated and it got out, like, um, was there any response from Congress? Yes, both the, um, the, the Armed Services Committee on the Senate side um, held hearings, and then on the House side, both on the House side and the Senate side, that we had champions. We had Jackie Spears on the House side, we had Kirsten Gillibrand on the Senate side, and so legislation was drafted and there was a big push to get this judicial system reformed. The, um, sadly, and what was the legislation? Just the, to um, the legislation is called the Military Justice Improvement Act. And what it would do, Walla, is it would take that adjudicatory power, that judicial power, away from the commanders. It wouldn't take it out of the military, but rather it would just say, wait, we have this robust law enforcement structure. We have plenty of JAGs, prosecutors, defense attorneys. We're going to keep all of the adjudication on the legal side of the house, and the warfighters and the commanders will be taken out of the mix. And so it was a tweak to the Uniform Code of Military Justice that would accomplish that. And what was the response of the military? The military, as they always do, they come in and they say, it's not that bad, and by the way, you need to trust us because we have zero tolerance and we're going to fix it. So the same thing happened as what I had seen, because when I first started, you know, I went and read all those hearings and I watched some of those older hearings on the, the video. It, it was like that Bill Murray movie, Groundhog Day. The exact same thing again and again, you know, almost down to the language. They would come in and they'd say, the military has zero tolerance. Well, you know, meanwhile, thousands of people are being raped every year, and they keep saying, we have zero tolerance. So they, they use the same play from the playbook. The other thing they did, which is something we learned just recently, is they, they kind of phonied up some data. They persuaded certain, certain senators um, that, they, that, in fact, if you took the commanders out of the mix, it would lead to fewer prosecutions. And they were, they were kind of saying, we need the commanders to put their thumb on the scale because that's actually better for the survivors, for the rape survivors, than taking them out of the mix. And they claimed that there were uh, uh, over 90 instances when commanders had pushed forward for prosecution when civilian authorities had not. Well, thanks to the, the diligence of an organization called Protect Our Defenders, that claim has been totally debunked. The, they FOIA'd the documents, and it's simply false. So the military use this kind of, you know, kind of spinning the data falsely 
to try to, to persuade people. And um, despite you know a really valiant effort by uh, Senator Gillibrand, the measure the measure was being filibustered, so it needed 60 votes, and it got 56. So even though a majority of the country and a majority of the Senate was in favor of the fix, the, 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 Department, of Just, the Department of Defense ended up being able to, to thwart the reform. And, and did you all reach out to President Obama or any of that, often, and how did they respond? Well, you know, the president has gone on record that it's a terrible situation, but he has not gone on record supporting the reforms. And instead, and this I, I think is, is interesting, instead all of the energy has now been shifted and focuses, focused on college campuses. And the president has put a lot of effort into eradicating rape on college campuses. And not, obviously I support that and that needs to be done too, but we're leaving this situation in which rape survivors in the military, you know, they have a, they have a workplace career issue at stake here. Right. So I think that the priority needs to be uh, focusing on those who wear the uniform of the United States, right. right? I mean, you know, when you see someone in a military uniform, that's you, that's me. These are our representatives. Right. So from my background, and it may be I'm influenced because I grew up, my dad was career army. But, you know, I grew up that they're a symbol of our nation. So I think, wait, you know, the, the priority needs to be on fixing it there. Right. So if anybody wants to contact and get involved in this movement, um, how do they get in contact with you? Well, they can either uh, give me a call, 410-733-5444, um, uh, or my email is sburke at burkeplc.com. Or they can reach out to the wonderful nonprofit called Protect Our Defenders. Interesting. Thank you so much for your hard work in protecting those to protect us. Well, and thank you for your interest, Wall, and for having me on your show. Really right. delighted. Well, if you want to catch out, check out more episodes or you need a lawyer, you can contact us at, um, go to the website at www.chatwiththelawyer.tv. And thank you for watching. No one more deserving of our thanks than our nation's veterans. So when a veteran's dealing with an injury or health problem, it's a privilege to help and support them in their recuperation. Help hospitalized veterans has found a unique way to do just that. They've pioneered the use of arts and craft kits as a therapeutic tool. HHV provides these kits to veterans to use in their homes at no charge. The kits can aid physical rehabilitation and they're also a valuable tool to help veterans with PTSD. They provide a creative outlet, relieve stress, and they also remind our veterans that there are plenty of folks who really care about them and want to thank them for their service. In some areas, veterans can use the kits in the company of other veterans at local community craft centers. If you're a veteran receiving health care anywhere, call this number to receive your free kit or visit hhv.org to learn more. Thank you. FSHD is one of the most common forms of muscular dystrophy. It's a degenerative disease that weakens muscles in the face, shoulders, upper back, and legs. FSHD robs you of your smile and makes simple tasks nearly impossible to perform. FSHD affects hundreds of thousands of people, but most have never met another patient. Many have not even been diagnosed. Someone you know may be living with FSHD. Let them know they are not alone and that we're making real advances toward a treatment. You can help by going to our website, fshsociety.org slash curefshd, and share the photos and facts about the disease using the hashtag curefshd. By simply raising awareness, you could change someone's life and help us get closer to a cure. Knowing that you have the power to give someone else a chance to live a healthy, productive life is the greatest gift. I'm London Fletcher, linebacker for the Washington Redskins. Anyone can choose to be a champion. Sign up to be an organ donor today and be sure to tell your family about your decision. Did you know that a single donor can save or improve the lives of up to 50 people? Let's be real, you don't need them when you're gone, but others do. 
You have the power to donate life. Sign up to be an organ, eye, and tissue donor at beadonor.org.